Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon from Manila. I'm Len George. I'm working with the ADB Pacific Energy Operations. Uh, welcome to the fifth webinar of the Mares series. We've had some very interesting presentations over the last month uh, and, and in the run up to the Asia Clean Energy Forum. The Mares TA is aligned with ADB's action plan for healthy oceans and sustainable blue economies and targets uh, some of our development, developing member countries with extensive coastlines. Uh, the TA focuses on regenerative marine aquaculture, cultivation of reefs, ocean-based renewables, and supports scaling up of these initiatives uh, to bring down costs. I have with me today, uh, Dan Millison. Dan is the manager of Transcendergy, a private consulting firm that's established in 2008. He has over 35 years of experience, including 20 years in sustainable infrastructure investment programs in Asia. He used to be a former project officer at the Asian Development Bank. He's currently a consultant, supporting an innovative, high impact technology for energy sector operations. He's played a very important role in, in, in uh, working with ADB to help our DMCs mobilize significant funding from the climate investment funds, as well as the GCF in areas of clean energy, sustainable transport, and other climate friendly technology. He has a bachelor's in geological sciences, a master's in civil engineering, and is a professional geologist and registered engineer. He's also been scuba diving for 40 years. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Dan for over 12 years now, including in some of ADB's pioneering work on uh, solar parks and renewable energy in, in South Asia, where I was posted before this. Dan is gonna do three things today. He's going to outline the insidious challenge that we face on ocean acidification and its implications. Um, he's going to look at potential opportunities for countries with extensive uh, EEZs as they explore energy, energy sector transitions and try and reduce their uh, mitigation footprint and improve their adaptation plans. And he's also helping uh, with some examples of what's been done on more developed markets and outlining specific cases of what we could do to take forward uh, this in the Asia and the Pacific. Um, over to you, Dan. Um, look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Lynn. Um, let me try and get this up here and get started. Um, yeah, I remember meeting Lynn back, I think it was maybe 2009 when, when you were a consultant and then you joined ADB. Uh, let's see, hopefully this will be up here in a second. Okay, uh, can you see that okay? Thank you. Yeah, you, you can see that okay? It's good, it's good. Okay, great. All right. So we live we live on planet C. That's and it is acidified. The ocean is, which I'll I'll get to in a minute. Um, so, you know, let me start. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll talk about you know pr complex problems and how we frame them, and then some of the science underneath the problems, the big problem, and then and then some project ideas for for Mara. So, um, I wanted to start off, you know, we're talking about energy and, and the, the energy transition globally is, is, pretty, is pretty well underway onshore, but what we do onshore is not enough to, to save the planet. And when we, when we talk about the energy transition, we mainly talk about it in terms of just electricity services and in, in terms of climate change. But I think we need to talk more expansively about and, and frame this in terms of commercial opportunities. And here's, here's a picture of the energy transition in Western Kansas in the United States. So in, in the foreground, you've got oil field operations. These are storage tanks for, for crude oil coming out of the ground. That's our legacy assets. And in, and in the background, as far as the eye can see, you've got wind, wind farms. And the, the reason the wind farms are there is not because of any climate change legislation in the US. 
it's because it's commercial. It's because people make make money on it. The people that provide the land get a royalty payment or a rental payment for use of the land by the wind farms. And so when we, if you if we're going to do this kind of operation in the U.S., we have to present it in in commercial terms. No one wants to talk about what might happen 100 years from now. And so the way I like to describe clean energy is that it's like oil and gas fields, but there's no carbon, there's no drilling required, there's no blowouts, there's no spills. And once you get the resources on, online, the reserves never decline, which is definitely the case for oil and gas fields, and especially the case for, for shale gas and shale oil. So the big picture, it, it's, we're, you know, we live on land, it's easy to forget that the earth is more than 70% covered by the oceans. And the oceans are the most important thing. How do we, so what problems are we trying to solve? There are three big problems which you may not have heard of, uh, but I think the three biggest problems are sea blindness, wealth blindness, and ocean acidification. Now, uh, the, the first two, you could read this blog there, the, the first asterisk by uh, Ian Ralby, which would only take you one or two minutes to read. Sea blindness and wealth blindness are psychological problems. Ocean acidification is, is the real problem. That's the biggest problem. And at this GOES Foundation, you can find an a encyclopedia of knowledge about the issues with ocean acidification. So what's sea blindness? Sea blindness is, is simply ignoring the sea or not looking at the sea. And it's in, in the most extreme example, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change process and the Paris targets pretty much ignore the oceans. And the Paris targets are not good for the oceans. And, and this is something that the marine science community has been talking about since at least 2009. But uh, basically they've been pretty much been left out of the discussion in the last couple of years. We've started to pick up this discussion again. Um, wealth blindness is when you, when you look at the sea, you don't, we don't see the, total value, or the potential value of the natural capital that's in the sea. And the, 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 the natural capital is in the exclusive economic zones, which are from 12 to 200 nautical miles from the coastline. And there are 27 ADB developing member countries with exclusive economic zones, and 20 are mostly exclusive economic zones. So here you can see, you know, 50% or more of the national area is actually exclusively economic zone. So how do we how do we monetize the natural capital in a in a sustainable manner? How do we how do we put this natural capital to work and how do we recognize the full the full value and the full potential? Uh, one of the ways that you've probably been hearing about is is hydrogen production. Uh, you may not be hearing too much about offshore renewable energy to hydrogen, but to get a sense of the potential scale here, if we were to deploy renewable energy like solar and wind, over 1% of the EEZ areas of ADB's developing member countries, uh, we would be able to produce the equivalent of today's total global electricity output that would displace 40% of global natural gas production and avoid 5 billion tons a year. And we would be creating an industry with revenues on the order of a trillion dollars a year. And again, offshore renewable energy to hydrogen, this is like a natural gas field, but no carbon, no drilling, no blowouts, no spills, the reserves never decline. The biggest physical problem, though, is ocean acidification. Ocean plastics is a big problem. Other pollution is a big problem. But ocean acidification is the biggest problem. Reefs, coral reefs, and most marine life are pretty happy when atmospheric CO2 was around 320 parts per million. 
when it goes above 350 parts per million, there's a tremendous amount of stress on marine ecosystems. And today we're at 412. Now the pH of seawater is on track to go down to 7.95 by 2050. And at this point, uh, phytoplankton and other calcifying organisms can't make their shells. And if we get to that 7.95, there's going to be an irreversible collapse of marine ecosystems. And I'll explain in a, in a minute why you should be, we should all be really concerned about this. Um, now, a little bit of science here. Uh, in seawater, there are multiple chemical reactions that occur simultaneously. So acidification is the, the one that is really a big problem with atmospheric CO2 going into seawater and making the water more acidic. We can counteract the acidification by, by calcification. We can do this by growing reefs, seagrass, and shellfish. And as we heard from Scott Countryman a couple of weeks ago, we can do this faster than, than the ocean is acidifying, acidifying lo locally. So we want that calcification reaction to occur faster, much faster than the acidification reaction. And I think what's, what's been missing in, in the global debate about climate change and, and environmental sustainability is that we're not, we're not framing the, the problems correctly. We, you know, we talk about stuff that's gonna happen 50 or 100 years from now. I, I think uh, maybe a better organizing principle is, is what, what is referred to as the three threes. So a typical person can live for about three weeks without food, for about three days without water, and for three minutes without oxygen. And these are not luxuries. So we should be really concerned about this. And, and if we talk about these three things, it's pretty easy to get people to pay attention as opposed to talking about how big the, the big hurricane might be 50 or 60 years from now. Now, the ocean economy today, it's, it's the antithesis of sustainability. We, we treat the oceans like a strip mine and we treat the oceans like a garbage dump. And we, we, we're doing this at a rate that's um, almost the, certain to cause collapse of marine ecosystems within another 20 or, or 30 years. Again, we don't want to get to that point where the pH is 7.95 or, or below. And there is some, some hope, um, which, you know, there's a little hope because we're, we're way behind schedule. The, the tipping point for coral reefs, that 350 parts per million, we crossed that in 2009, 2010, and we've seen the effects already uh, massive coral bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef in 2015 and 16, and, and again since then. Um, so as we've been talking about in this, in this webinar series, there, there were four segments to the new ocean economy that we need to create, marine aquaculture, reefs, renewable energy, and, and ecotourism. And these are in, in this MARA's technical assistance program of ADB, which is aligned with sustainable development goals 14, which is life underwater, SDG seven, which is access to energy, other sustainable development goals, ADB's strategy 2030, operational priority three is for responding to environment, climate change, and ADB's healthy oceans plan for 5 billion in investment. And um, I'll talk a, a bit more about, about the types of investments and, and the scale, which is much, much bigger than this $5 billion. Uh, now, MARAS is not a new idea. MARAS has actually been done in the Gulf of Mexico of the United States. And it started with 
fossil energy, okay, oil and gas production. And it evolved into a cultivated reefs program. And this is a map which shows the, the black symbols are oil and gas drilling and production platforms in, in the outer continental shelf region. And the red symbols are artificial reefs. I prefer to use the term cultivated reefs. Uh, in my mind, there are two kinds of reefs, live reefs and dead reefs. Uh, artificial reefs are live in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see the oil and gas structures extend over from the, the coastlines of Texas and Louisiana over to Mississippi and Alabama. There's never been any offshore oil and gas production in, in the waters off the state of Florida, but there's a huge number of cultivated reefs over there. A lot of those are, are ships which have been cleaned up and sunk purposely to function as, as reefs. Um, now, the, the Rig to Reef program began in 1987, and 11% of decommissioning was done by leaving rigs, production platforms, which we refer to as rigs, in, in the water. And these support sport diving, sport fishing, and regional uh, commercial seafood production, especially the red, the red snapper production in the Gulf of, of Mexico. Uh, so we've had almost 35 years to document how this works. And there's not really any question about whether rigs to reef is a good thing. It's, it's, it's a good thing. Um, and the, the, there's even a longer period of research on the oil and gas rigs offshore Southern California. There's more marine biodiversity on those offshore rigs than there are in the, in the marine protected areas off California. And these two pictures here are from active rigs off the coast of Southern California. Now, if we take this conversion rate of 11%, uh, there's about 1,500 rigs in Southeast Asia. We would have 100 to 150 candidates. There are already seven in, in the Philippines. Uh, I'll come back to this and talk about this some more. Uh, so Mars in the 21st century, what's, what's going on um, already in the, in the offshore renewable energy business? We are now seeing commercial projects to convert wind energy to hydrogen and use hydrogen as an, as an energy carrier. And this is basically a form of geomimicry. We're, we're taking you know, oil and gas is stored solar and biomass and geothermal energy. We're, we're taking renewable energy and making hydrogen. Again, it's kind of like natural gas, no carbon, no drilling. Um, the petroleum industry, the big players in the offshore oil and gas business are getting into the offshore wind business. And most of those companies are also getting into the, the renewable energy to hydrogen business. And this is happening in the North Sea, where we've got more than 30 years of experience of, in offshore wind operations. But in the global equation, the North Sea is a very small place. It, it's crowded with offshore oil and gas operations, with offshore wind operations, with, with shipping, with fishing. And so for, the, for, for ocean, based natural capital to be a global solution, we, we have to look at other areas, especially ADB's developing member country exclusive economic zones. Um, but the offshore wind business is going to continue to grow. And in particular, there is an opportunity to leapfrog to floating wind. Um, one of the rate limiting factors, probably the biggest rate limiting factor in offshore wind development today is the lack of heavy lift vessels to do bottom founded installations. So if we do floating wind, we can fabricate the floating structure and the wind turbine assembly in a shipyard and tow it out to the wind farm site without the need for those heavy lift vessels. So. Um, 
we're already seeing some 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 of this leapfrogging. And in the Mars context, we have uh, done some preliminary identification of what the what the value chain would be. So we take ocean-based energy or offshore energy, offshore renewable energy ore, and convert it to electricity and use that electricity for value-added production. So one, one point I'd like to emphasize is that in, in the renew, renewable energy business and, and within ADB especially, when we talk about energy, we tend to talk only about electricity. And when we talk about renewable energy, we tend to focus only on, in, on electricity supply. So under ADB strategy 2030, the emphasis is not on electricity supply. Electricity and other energy are, are inputs to the seven operational priorities. And so we need to focus on the productive use of energy. And this is just a, a uh, snapshot of what that potential value chain looks like. And I, I like to use the term mining of offshore renewable energy, MORE. A ADB is an acronym happy organization, so MORE. And I, uh, you can remember this easily because I've trademarked this. And if you write this down or, or say this, then you have to give me a, a case of beer every time you do that. So MORE, or if you don't wanna use that power to X, is the other term of art. So let me talk about the types of projects that, that we could do, that ADB could do, and ADB's development partners to do. And these are not official definitions, but just working definitions to give you an idea. You know, what can we do on existing sites? What can we do on marine related sites? What can we do in terms of, of greenfield, you know, from, from the bottom up projects? So this one I think is is actually pretty pretty easy. Um, <laughs> that's West, the province of West Papua in Indonesia, where Indonesia's third LNG export project is located. Uh, it's offshore natural gas production that's brought onshore, and the gas is cleaned up and liquefied and exported. And ADB's private sector department uh, helped finance the first two LNG trains with an investment approved in 2005, and then another investment approved in 2016 for LNG train three. And this should be of interest, you know, because we've got big sponsors there, British Petroleum. And as I mentioned, other, other big international oil and gas companies are getting into the renewable energy to hydrogen business. Um, the gas fields are eventually going to decline become unprofitable or otherwise be stranded. So we can use the water, we can deploy floating solar in the water. That red circle there is a thousand hectares, which is big enough for 500 megawatts of solar to hydrogen kit. We can use the onshore infrastructure to process that, to convert that renewable energy to hydrogen or, and or convert hydrogen to other products like ammonia and methanol and use the port infrastructure to export that into global markets. And you may recall last week, Mike Window talked about a uh, 50 kilowatt tidal energy project that's over here in this neighborhood somewhere, I'm not sure exactly where. Um, we could then scale that up by a factor of five at, at least. And the value of that, the you know, the revenue at a target price of two thousand dollars per ton would be one hundred forty million dollars per year. Um, the other, I think, what's what's low hanging fruit, if you will, is the potential for a rig to reef program in Southeast Asia. Um, the cost of full removal is typically about fifty million dollars if we have to take the platform out of the water and, and manage everything on land. Conversion costs, if we leave the rig in the water, it's up to 15 million. So we would start out with savings of $35 million per rig that's left in the water. 100 rigs, it's uh, $3.5 billion in, in savings. And uh, to give you an idea of where these 
these are, there's a big concentration in the Gulf of Thailand, uh, offshore Malaysia, off the northwest coast of Borneo, some rigs offshore of Vietnam, the east coast of Kalimantan in Indonesia, north coast of Java, some off Sumatra, and over here in the, in the Timor Gap. So I would emphasize here that ADB's job as a knowledge bank is to come up with, a, with solutions, to diagnose the issues, come up with solutions. In this case, we know that we've got a solution in the form of a rig to reef program. And ADB's job as a development bank is to finance those solutions. In this case, we would start out with $3.5 billion of savings on a 100 rig program. How would we mobilize that investment? And, and what, would, what would be done in terms of repurposing these rigs for productive use? They already, already have reefs on them. We can build aquaculture around them. Um, they could be powered by captive renewable energy. Such a project would not be a typical ADB renewable energy project built around a power purchase agreement. It would have a different structure. Um, and we know that this can be, rig to reef can be integrated uh, with ecotourism as we've, as we've seen in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's the rig there is off Malaysia near a marine protected area. This picture at the lower right is one of the active rigs off Southern California. And a few kilometers away from that active rig is this um, marine aquaculture. This is Catalina Sea Ranch, which is a shellfish and, and seagrass operation. There's a much bigger opportunity if we look at the global shipping industry. Uh, you may be aware that International Maritime Organization has regulations on cleaner fuels and greenhouse gas control that kicked in last year. The global fleet is subject to these regulations. I've done some calculations and, and talked to some shipping experts about this. So typical Panamax vessel, if we retire it early and shave off 10 years of operations, will cut out 1 million tons of CO2 emissions. That ship would be replaced by a new ship, which would have to meet the 2030 or 2050 target of a 50% CO2 reduction. So we would get half a million tons of CO2 reduction per, per ship and using ADB's social cost of carbon, $35 per ton, we would have a value, and this is natural capital, of $17.5 million per ship retired. Now, again, ADB's role would be in a program uh, would be to figure out how to monetize this value. And um, this is about creating natural capital. What could we do with these ships? Um, we, uh, I've been really inspired by some discussions uh, with uh, Leo Bantad at, at ACE in Singapore. Uh, this picture here is an operating uh, floating aquaculture system. These are some of the tanks inside and some renderings of, of how these might be expanded. The, the, this would become a, uh, a fish farm, a fish market, and a, a tourist destination, all powered by solar energy. So we could take old ships out of service early and retrofit them for this kind of aquaculture operation. And it would be straightforward to add on reef cultivation. Uh, it would be, it would take some work to add renewable energy, but the typical Panama, Panama ship, Panamax ship can take a lot of containers and all of this stuff is modular. So we can add modules of desal electrolysis, hydrogen production that that retrofitted ship can be a floating filling station for hybrid electric or fuel cell boats, a seafood market, a dive resort. And then ultimately we could really retire the ships and sink them as, as reefs. Uh, remember the map I showed earlier that, that showed all of the cultivated reef sites in the Gulf of Mexico, the ones off Florida, a lot of those are wrecks and um, we've got, again, decades of experience 
to know that these can be res responsibly managed. And um, ADB's role again would be to come up with some kind of a financial solution to help monetize the value of the avoided CO2. And if the ship is actually then sunk and converted to, to reef, maybe there's some additional uh, kind of carbon credit that could be monetized. Um, now, worst case, if we do a program like this, we take the ships out of service 10 years early and they go straight to the scrapyard. That wouldn't be such a bad thing because that, you know, we would still have the avoided value, the avoided CO2 value, and those ships would be displacing virgin production of, of iron and, and steel. And one point I would emphasize here is that every ADB developing member country with a coastline could have a, reg a Rex to Reef program. There will not be a shortage of ships to do this. Um, now for Bluefield, Maldives is a really good example that I like to point to because it's an ocean economy. The, the economy is tourism and fishing, not necessarily sustainable, but it could be much more sustainable and it could be re regenerative. And the private sector, which has a lot of autonomy in the tourism industry, can lead the transition. So here's a, an example of a site. ADB has done some, some study on this Kura Island uh, about five years ago to see what it would take to convert the island to 100% renewable energy, renewable electricity. There are private resorts on either side of the island, and the resorts would buy renewable energy from Hura Island if it was firm, i.e. 24-7 electricity, and if it were cheaper than, than diesel. So the, and these resorts typically charge $750 a night per person, and the customers that go to these resorts, I'm sure would be willing to pay a little, a little extra if they were running on renewable energy. Now, the suggestion here is that the, the resorts and other islands can host new ocean-based renewable energy technology development and share in the intellectual property rights with technology vendors. Um, and we have a long list of what would be required to make these operations regenerative. What can you do at the destinations? What can you do getting people to and from the destinations? And my initial back of the envelope guess is that a typical resort with a continuous demand of one megawatt would need about five megawatts of floating solar and storage. And um, that would cost about five to $10 million but that cost would be recovered within four, four or five years. Um, we do have a pretty good idea. ADB's South Asia Energy Division is already doing some mapping, looking at the floating solar potential. It's pretty easy to see where candidate sites are, where you, want, you don't want to park floating solar right on top of coral if you can avoid it. And there are already some existing floating solar operations here Dan, you're about 30 minutes now. Okay, um, I've got about five more minutes left. Yes. So, here, so, we, so we pretty much know how to do this and ADB South Asia Energy Division does have a new investment in the works to support floating solar and, and storage. And that would include some technical assistance for private resorts to do floating solar as well. And we can use some of that solar energy to grow reefs. We heard about this from Scott Countryman a couple of weeks ago and add uh, regenerative marine aquaculture so we could have locally produced low emissions, high protein seafood with essentially zero food miles. We could use some of that solar energy to power boats as well. Um, the offshore wind business as I said, it's it's going to grow, and I'm I'm sorry that I don't have a higher resolution map here. I can't figure out how to get the image from the Global Wind Atlas and make it nice and clear. But but the darker reddish color are the better wind sites. So pretty good potential off Pakistan, 
south tip of India, Sri Lanka, uh, coast of Vietnam, parts of the Philippines, over in the northern Marshall Islands. Um, again, power, power to X, green hydrogen, other Mars op operations. I think there's easily commercial potential to do 10 gigawatts of wind in ADB's developing member countries in the foreseeable future. And if that were augmented with green hydrogen production, we'd be looking at total investment of probably on the order of about uh, $50 billion for 10 gigawatts at today's system costs. Okay, so what about some of the some of the countries out in the in the Pacific where they're 99 plus percent exclusive economic zone or, or mostly water, as is the case with the Maldives? So here in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, just to give you a sense of the scale, this is a uh, hundred hectares at Majuro, which would be big enough for a 50 megawatt solar to hydrogen uh, system, and we we could expand that. If we move over to Arno Atoll, that's 2,000 hectares. So we could do a 20-fold expansion right there before replicating in the other atolls. We've got existing wrecks to reefs in some of the northern atolls where the wind is really good. Um, so a combination of solar and wind looks pretty good. Um, Palau looks like a really good candidate for Mara's investments that we heard from Tom Bowling a couple, you know, three weeks ago about the regenerative marine aquaculture, which are ready for scale up. We've got a, a marine based tourism industry that needs to be reinvented. I've talked to some of those tour operators. They are interested in electric or hybrid boats. Um, what might be a major change there would be to take some of those old ships and refit them for liveaboard tourism, the Malaysia Sea Ventures Diver model. And our, the, how, do we, how do we get a project like this going? Well, the government has to lead. And I, the, the government has to make physical space available in the water to do offshore renewable energy. Is the, the resources on land aren't, aren't big enough to really get to the government's interest in green hydrogen for export. So our first business model for reference is offshore oil and gas and offshore wind, where the government leases space to the private sector. The monetizing, uh, taking advantage of that, that potential offshore renewable energy, we would need to scale it up to have a surplus for export, then our business model is like liquefied natural gas exports where, where we have buyers that commit to a 20 to 30 year offtake agreement. And that anchors the financing that's needed to go ahead and build the project. And then uh, we also have learned how to do some of these things from the solar parks experience in India, Cambodia, where the government acts as the developer and the government prepares a shovel ready project that is then tendered out to the private sector. And this, this is what we refer to as the one ADB model where ADB's regional departments help the government develop the project along with ADB's office of public private partnerships. The, the, the projects, the actual investment, the, the construction of the renewable energy to hydrogen would they be tendered out to the private sector and ADB's private sector operations department can come in and help finance the, the winning bids. And here we've got um, 100 hectares, that small red circle, which could be for a prototype and then that could be scaled up to 1000 hectares, 500 megawatt scale, that could be expanded two or three times, maybe five times without interfering with marine traffic and other uses. Ultimately, to get to that 1% of the EEZ, there would need to be technology advances in open water, solar, um, big cost reductions in floating wind. The wind resources in Palau aren't that good. Ocean thermal energy conversion, we heard from Mike Abunda last week. That's still pre-commercial, but that is of interest. And there you know, is an opportunity for Palau to help develop 
that OTEC technology and share in the intellectual property. Um, okay, anybody can do green hydrogen, but regenerative hydrogen, what's that? Regenerative hydrogen is the Mares concept applied to offshore renewable energy. And green hydrogen, a green hydrogen project would have one revenue stream. We would sell hydrogen. That would be it. The project would have to be built around that. Regenerative hydrogen with the Mars concept, we would be making hydrogen. We would be making oxygen, which humans can live for about three minutes without oxygen. We would make fresh water. Humans can live for about three days without fresh water. We would have reefs, which would support seafood production. And humans can live for about three weeks without food. And this would support tourism. What's missing here, what we don't know, is what's the role of the carbon markets and could we mobilize carbon finance to make these kind of investments happen? Uh, so what I've run through here, um, there's nothing far-fetched uh, about this. this. This has been done before. In the foreseeable future, I can see 25 to $50 billion of investment easily just in the offshore wind sector alone, um, that's a lot of money, but we need a lot of money invested in the oceans to save the planet. We need a trillion dollars a year for the next several years. That's a lot of money, but it's less than 1% of GDP. So I'll stop there and, and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, that was a really interesting presentation. Um, we have quite a turnout, and I'd request uh, the participants, uh, particularly the attendees, uh, to write in their questions or comments so that we can take them up um, for discussion. Uh, from my perspective, um, you know, I, I think it's it's really great uh, to see how we have moved in Asia. You know, from the first solar parks where we were very focused on on getting some of these renewable energy projects, the small five megawatt ones uh, kicked off. I, I recall at tariffs of about 20, 25 cents and how over a period of eight to 10 years, we have seen that these projects have scaled up dramatically uh, to gigawatt scale uh, projects with uh, tariffs coming down to you know, two cents or three cents. And, and the role that ADB uh, plays in, in, in trying to you know, consult with stakeholders and trying to support on the studies on getting the right partnerships and, of course, uh, looking at financing. Uh, so this uh, is, is really interesting in terms of how this takes it from there to something that's a little more, you know, wider economy wide uh, impact in terms of what Maris can help achieve. Um, I had one uh, question and I'll probably kick off with the questions. Um, you did mention about you know, potentially advance market commitments, uh, you know, for, um, for uh, regenerative hydrogen. We've, ADB has supported uh, elements of that on the demand side earlier in terms of, you know, looking at renewable energy credits or, or you know, renewable procurement obligations in some of our countries. Um, how do you see interest in, um, in regenerative hydrogen from a market commitment point of view? Uh, are there any um, any thoughts you'd like to share on that, Dan? Uh, sure, thanks. Um, we are yeah, and and Japan are the countries that come up um, in this discussion, and. I and I've heard that um, you know the Japanese government is is having some discussions with some of ADB's developing member countries about hydrogen, hydrogen, green hydrogen production. Um, the advanced market commitment. Um, I mean that I use that term in a in a broad generic sense to include a a long term contract. Um, but I would I would emphasize the experience with liquefied natural gas exports, where we start with a stranded gas field 
and then it, it's big enough to justify liquefaction if the price is right. So buyers agree to a 20 year or longer offtake contract and that anchors the, the financing for the project. Now, the, the, uh, most of the early LNG export projects did not have a fixed price. They were not like a renewable energy power purchase agreement. They, the LNG export contracts were based on a pricing formula that was linked to crude oil prices. And Japan has been one of the big players in this, in this market. And Japan is talking about a hydrogen economy, the hydrogen Olympics in Tokyo, if they ever happen. Um, so I, I think it's a, intellectually, it's a, it's a pretty simple step to go from the experience in the LNG business to the uh, green hydrogen business. And just a, a couple of examples to, to think about. I mean, in, in, uh, you know, we're seeing this in the, in the North Sea um, that is gonna, where the hydrogen will be consumed in, in Europe. Uh, just a day or two ago, I saw a news article about uh, the Sultanate of Oman is developing a program with 25 gigawatts of solar and wind that will be for hydrogen production. And the hydrogen will be exported using the existing LNG export infrastructure and existing port infrastructure. And Oman isn't special, right? I mean, the, the renewable energy resources are there in ADB's member countries. And some of the infrastructure is there, like the Tangu example. Thanks. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you for that um, for that uh, extra information. Um, we have uh, an interesting uh, comment from Nick Lambert. Um, he was on our first webinar. Um, great presentation, and his query, if I may paraphrase it, is. Um, you know, ship disposal and scrapping is 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 a fairly dirty industry. Um, you know, there are health and safety issues. There are negative environmental impacts. How best do you think, um, or, or do you think the regenerative uh, recycling program? Um, you know, how best can we get a viable business model around it? Uh, you know, to make that um, essentially. Uh, you know, uh, equivalent to the cash for clunkers that we're seeing happen elsewhere. Um, any any thoughts on that in terms of um, what could be looked at and what could be done? Yeah, thanks, and thanks, uh, Admiral Lambert, for that that question. It's 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 a an important question. You know, the ship disposal, the ship scrapping business is is pretty big, and it's pretty big in in India and Bangladesh, which are ADB client countries. And it is a pretty, it is a pretty dirty industry. Um, the opportunity that I see is that actually those two, the, the operations in India and Bangladesh could be reinvented to be environment, really environmentally responsible and, and sustainable. Um, the know-how is, is there, the, the, the labor, there's semi-skilled labor and skilled labor involved in, in scrapping ships. So the know-how is there with a little bit of training and, and retooling. Those, those ship, those scrapyards could be converting the ships for the kind of Maris operation that I mentioned. And just to give a, to give a sense of how this, this might work and this, okay, this is kind of a wacky idea, but you know, the, in India, the second generation of wind power development globally, what, what's in India, there's, there's more than 6,000 megawatts of wind turbines, which were installed by 2005. And most of those are the 300 kilowatt scale wind turbines, which today those could be replaced with, with much larger, like say three megawatt units, those turbines could be reconditioned and, and refitted for marine use and put on and put on a ship. It's, you know, we're talking about 
uh, adding about 100 tons of mass to a Panama ship, actually, the mass is about 20,000 to 30,000 tons. So this is doable. It would require some, some in engineering. Um, but there's, there's an opportunity to reinvent that ship scrapping business into a, a, an environmentally sustainable business. Is there interest on the part of the stakeholders in that business? I don't know. There's one way to find out, which is to really push uh, the dialogue with, uh, with the governments in, in India and, and Bangladesh uh, to, to try and do that. I hope that answers the, the question. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, um, look forward to receiving any more questions from from, from uh, attendees. We have one that's coming from Keshan Samarasinghe. Um, so Keshan would like to know, how could ADB aid with the planning for five-year, 10-year, 15-year roadmaps uh, from hydrogen and how, what might be some of the critical assumptions on costs as well as, you know, policy and technology developments. Um, so, so Dan, again, you know, we're, 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 we're in a year where there's a, there's a copy event happening. There's a lot of focus on looking at net zero um, and, and countries are, you know, in the process of updating some of their plans. Um, how do you see hydrogen fit into some of this work? Uh, that's currently happening, and and what do you think could could drive that uh, regenerative hydrogen? Well, Thank you. I think, yeah, I think um, you know the the simple answer for how ADB can aid is that through ADB's ongoing operations with client countries, the country partnership strategy and the country operations business plan, AD, ADB can can introduce the ideas that I've presented today. And especially, I think, um, I think it's especially important to talk about the need for ocean health and investment in restoring ocean ecosystems. And I think part of what's been missing in that in that dialogue is that, the, you know, we don't talk about the three threes. You know, we we arm wave about things that are going to happen fifty or hundred years from now, which you know decision makers today don't really care what's gonna happen. Um, so I think that that dialogue is actually already starting to happen. I know ADB is providing through one of the TAs is looking at some hydrogen development in um, Pakistan. ADB has some ongoing investments in China, which includes some hydrogen bus components with, um, um, which are done as urban development projects and not energy projects. Um, in terms of the assumptions on costs, policy, technology development, there's we, we can do this, what I've described can be done today with off-the-shelf technology. Nothing new needs to be invented. We, we do need um, a commitment to scale to drive down the cost of electrolyzers. Um, again, referring to, you had mentioned in India, and the solar parks program there, um, the intent in India with the solar parks was to create economies of scale, which did not exist before. Um, so the government promoted a program to, for rapid massive scale up of solar PV, which was, and, and other solar energy, it was technology neutral actually. Um, and the commitment was to scale with the understanding that the modularity of solar, there are inherent manufacturing economies of scale. So the more we build, the cheaper it, the cheaper it gets. Now the early uh, solar parks projects, the, the power purchase agreements, you know, were in the range. The early ones, ten years ago, were in the range of like fifteen cents U.S. per kilowatt hour, and even and even higher. And when 3000 megawatts of solar had been installed, from that point on, the power purchase agreements were at grid parity. And then a few years later, got to coal parity. And that 3000 megawatts, that only took four years. Uh, so today, 
Uh, my estimates, you know, for using solar to convert to hydrogen, we need the, the cost of production of solar to be down to, to less than two cents per kilowatt hour. And we're seeing that all, all over the world. Uh, so I don't, I don't think there, there needs to be a huge exercise in policy development other than the governments need to recognize that, that their NDCs under the Paris Agreement really need to be uh, beefed up a lot. Getting to zero is not going to be enough. We need to draw down to try and get atmospheric CO2 back down to, to that 350 parts per million. And we're talking about a trillion tons of CO2 that needs to be drawn down, not avoided, but drawn down. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Uh, it's been a it's been a very interesting webinar. Um, I think we've we've learned a lot about how um, the 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 impact of acidification on oceans and what it could mean for us, but also very interestingly how some of these projects can be um, contextualized in, in, in terms of ADB DMCs um, and the opportunities uh, that they have uh, to you know, support on this, um, on this new, new front uh, that's, uh, that, that'll increasingly be an area of focus. ADB, of course, has been um, vocal about what we can do on the ocean health front, and this would be a very important part of, of that uh, portfolio. Um, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for the presentation. Thank you uh, to all the attendees uh, who joined us today. And, and thank you for some of the wonderful questions. Um, with that, I think uh, we can conclude this particular session. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.